Doctor, who will be speaking about uh, a reappraisal of the figures of the of speech of the old Javanese Ramayana. Sorry about that. I want you to hear a little bit of what it sounds like in Bali. And this was the old Japanese Ramayana. Uh, no, no, thank you. Um, which is still being used in Bali in a context called Mabasan, where the old Javanese Kakawin are pronounced line by line and sometimes half line by half line. And then a, a, another person who speaks a literary, re, a literary register of Balinese translates it. It takes about, average session is about four hours. And it's usually <coughs> older, older people, like myself. Um, I studied it when I was doing my doctoral research. And it was just really enthralling to hear this happening. This is the, the poetry of a thousand years ago being recited today. Um, so I just wanted you to notice that it's there. We can hear it. We can go to Bali and listen to people. We'd have to learn Balinese to understand what they were saying. In fact, I went to do my research. I thought I was going to do it in Indonesian. And I went, my teacher said, yes, come tomorrow night to the session. And I, I couldn't understand a word. It was Balinese, so I had to spend a year and a half studying Balinese. So it's a really beautiful thing. So I just wanted you to be aware that we have this beautiful tradition of ongoing tradition. Um, I, I think I'll have to jump right into the handbag as soon as possible with just a bit of background. As Helen pointed out, the old Javanese Ramayana is rather an, the oddball. It's probably dated in its first phase around 856, and there isn't anything else in Kakawin until 1035. In an article of 1958, Hoikas said that the old Javanese Ramayana is the exemplary Kakawin. It sets the standard for everything to follow. It's a little bit of an exaggeration because it's a really sprawling piece of work and nobody, nobody copies that form afterwards. There's a new form that's introduced in 1035 by Mpu Kanwa, which is much closer to the Indian copy form. Each canto is self-contained. It has one meter. It doesn't end with a different meter, but it has one meter. Whereas in the old Javanese Kakawin, you can have cantos of 200 verses with 16 different meters. So it's very much the oddball. Another thing that's odd about it is it allows hiatus and doubling of consonants metricosa. And I traced this, at least I think I traced it, to the Lalita Vistara, which was, is well known to have been illustrated at Borobudur. My assumption is that if it's illustrated at Borobudur, someone must have been studying it. And that study of the Lalita Vistara must have given them the idea, well, we can get around some of these metrical problems with hiatus and doubling. That's not done later. Starting in 1035, there's no more hiatus and doubling. So it's the oddball. Um, and I talked about it in the context of what I call the prehistory of the Kakawin. My assumption is that before this work appears in 856, there's a long gestation period. Because not only does the Kakawin appear in 856, but the language of the Kakawin appears in 856. It's the first time we really have the language. The liter we have, yes, we have old Javanese. We have it in the inscriptions. But in the inscriptions, it's not really clear yet that this language is fully literized. It seems more like it's a real everyday language, which is in the process of being literized. But in the Kakawin, it's fully literized. But is it fully, or is it experimental? My take on this at this point is that the old Javanese Ramayana may, may well be something like um, an experiment in pedagogy. It's been recorded in a textual form. I'll get more into that later and just jump in right here. Um, if Hoikas' assumption is right that the old Javanese Ramayana is the exemplary Kakawin, then we would expect that the metrical tradition of, uh, not the metrical, the Alankara tradition of old Javanese starts with the translation of Bhattikavya 10, <coughs> Canto 10 into old Javanese Ramayana Canto 11. 
But there's very strange things going on with that, and I'll try to show what those are. Um, it's a little bit artificial in a sense what I'm going to be saying because it was kind of a, a, my approach to this was rather messy. I was going back and forth between different chapters, but uh, concentrating on the 12th chapter. But now what I've done is decided that it, let's look at the 12th chapter. Which of the 11th, I'm sorry, which, which of the Alankaras of Bhati 10 are directly translated into Old Javanese Ramayana 11? And which ones really look like they're the same Alankara? And I came up with a set of nine. It's a very small set. Only nine of the plus or minus 22 figures of Bhati show up as fully fledged translations of the Alankara in the old Javanese Ramayana. And so I, I theorized that that could be a template. We could take that set and then apply it to other parts of the Kakawin to see if we have something like a tradition or a schemata. I'm looking at this as a possible schemata for the production of Kakawin, a schemata for how do you write figures. Um, the ones that show up are very similar to the set that Walter Eichel discovered in 1926 in a very important paper, very little known paper, but very important paper. He traced nine Alankaras in the old Javanese tradition, and he relates them all to the Kavya Darsha. But he doesn't say why, and he doesn't show any proof as to why that should be the particular text that he's chosen. Hoikas, in 19, Hoikas was so excited by this work that he translated it into Dutch in 1929. In 1958, Hoikas wrote his famous work on the Javan Javanese Kakawan as the exemplary Kakawan. Um, and he refers to the handbooks of Bamaha and Dundon, but he doesn't say much more than that. He wanted to go on with that work. In 1957, he had written a paper called On Some Arta Alankaras in the Bhati Kavya 10. And in that work, he said he hoped in it within his lifetime to study the old Javanese Ramayana in terms of its alankaras based on Bhattikavya 10. But he never was able to do that. And so in a sense, I'm picking up on what he wanted to do. And I looked at Bhattikavya 10 related to old Javanese Ramayana 11. And the, the number of figures that I feel are, can positively be identified as translated directly from Bhatti are Rupaka, Upama, Upame, Upama, possibly. I'm not quite sure if, it's, if that's correct or not. Vyati Reka, Utpreksha, Utpreksha Avayava, Atishayokti, Artantara Nyasa, Sandeha. And then there's a problematical point. Bhatti's Apanoti does not align with the definitions of the Alankarikas, as Fallon has pointed out. It has only the um, the uh, element of, of denial, but no comparison. From Eichli, however, we can add Apanuti from examples that he links to KD 2303. So he, let's look at the first example. I'll have to get water. The first example is one of, was from Batikavya 11. And this is a translation of the 26th verse, which is a rupaka. And I, in the translation, I've underlined the words which seem to be, be being used as jyotaka for similes. And I've used boldface type to indicate the kinds of referential constructions which are so common in old Javanese to establish equa equative circumstances. So I associate those with the possibility of rupaka. In other words, the underlined passages seem to me to refer to the apparatus of simile, whereas the dark, the bold face lexemes or morphemes refer to something more direct, which does not have the mediation that we think of with simile. In fact, it has the suppression of the mediation. So looking at the translation, because of the magnitude of his being like a mountain, his broad, this is about Hanuman, I'm at, I think you're all familiar with, would be familiar with the um, Bhattikavya version, and the old Javanese is faithful to the old 
to the cup, Batikavya. Because of the magnitude of his being like a mountain, his broad chest there can be called its slopes, while his long thick hair can be called its forest. And there, his head is its peak. And those arrows are snakes, his wounds are caves, while his blood is comparable to the ochre ores of the caves. And of course, note that the Jyota can hear is Tulia. That was what the monkeys said as they happily praised him, all elated as they spoke, nudging each other with knowing glances. Now, based on that and taking the, the, a hint from that construction, those constructions with kaharan, kaharan means to be called or to be named, and the referential constructions like ya ikana and ya, I began to theorize the possibility of a, of a set of dyotakas matching, not matching, but doing the same kinds of things that Dundon does in Kavya Darsha 257 to 65. So if you look at the uh, number four, morphemes and phrases supporting Upama and Utpreksha in Dundon and the OGR, OJR, okay? The ones in boldface are the ones that continue to persist in Old Javanese, although not always um, establishing simile. The ones that definitely do are Iva, Yatha, Tulya, Prakasha, and Upama. Those all are found in Old Javanese as Jyotaka, with similes. Um, for Utpreksha, of course, I won't repeat, um, well, I will, okay. Dundon says, Manye, Shanke, Dhruvam, Prayaha, Nunam. Now, anybody who's worked with Old Javanese for any length of time will constantly have to deal with words that have to do with comparisons. And there's, there are many, and you'll see this list. I've listed them here, and I think this is pretty close to being the full set. Morphemes supporting similes in Old Javanese. Now, I use the OJED, the Old Javanese English Dictionary, as the source. And these numbers, this does not mean that this is the, the limit of the number in the corpus. It just means it's the limit in the number of the corpus that Zultmuller worked with. But he's a reliable source. He has a good sense of the distribution of things. And let's look at this. Kadi, which means like, 4,700 times, including 469 in the Old Javanese Ramayana. And then there are variations on that. Katon Kadi be seen to be like, 36 times, including six in the OJR. Luir, having the appearance, 2,486 times, including many in the OJR. Sakshat, 550 times, many in the OJR. Tulia, 335 in the OGED, many in the OJR. Himpr, 269, one in the OJR. Pili, 246, six in the OJR. Pinda, 146, two in the OJR. Kaharan, 52 in the OJED, including 13 in the OJR. Iwa, 29 times in the OJID, but it doesn't even appear in the OJR. It appears first in the Arjuna Viwaha, 200 years later. Akan, which uh, to be considered as 23 times, including 18 in the old Javanese Ramayana. And finally, Upama, and this is a very significant one for me because while there are seven in the OJED, only two of those are usages which are as Jyotaka, and significantly they are in the old Javanese Ramayana. And that's one of the points where I feel we, we have a point where, let's see, what can I say about this? Um, if we assume that the poets of the old Javanese Ramayana are learning from the Indian tradition, their use of upama exclusively illustrates something about the, the historical level of the old Javanese Ramayana. This is the level at which the poets of old Java, of ancient Java, are seeking to translate the Indian system into the Javanese system. And it makes sense that they would use upama, but where did they get upama from? So we'll go into that later. Now another thing that I noticed as I went through these things is that there are very interesting things that go on with Utpreksha in Old Javanese Ramayana. One, and these are verbs of, uh, first of all, ru. Many times there'll be a passage about something in nature which has, is said to ru something. 
which means to be aware of something, to, be, to perceive something, to know something. And that shows up in the old Javanese of prekshas. But even more significant is maha, which is an auxiliary verb to do something intentionally. And that shows up in the prekshas with regularity to the extent that I started to think, well, is this intentional? Are they aware? Are they consciously aware of what's going on with Utpreksha and are using this verb of intentionality to bring that out? This began to give me the feeling that there is intentionality going on here and that the poets of old Java have begun to develop an apparatus to support the Alankaras. But is it so that, that if it's so that, that the translation of Bhattikavya 10 into Old Javanese Ramayana is the beginning of the tradition, what would happen if we took the set that I've just extrapolated and take it back to the beginning of the Old Javanese Ramayana? So that's what happens in part five, which I refer to as an Arta Alankara block in Old Javanese Ramayana 2, 4 to 19. Now some of this material repeats material from Bhattikavya, and some of it's invented. It's, ex it's extra. In fact, the whole idea that the Old Javanese Ramayana is a translation is slightly misguided. Um, many times there are many, many more verses in, an, in the Old Javanese Ramayana than there are in the Bhattikavya. Um, and many times there are whole sections developed, as in uh, Bhattikavya 11, there's something called the, the, the letter of Sita. Almost 30 verses, completely new and absolutely gorgeous. Sita's um, letter to Rama and his reply. I mean, not reply, but his reactions to it. Completely not there in Bhattikavya. So it's not really a translation. It's using t translation techniques to give energy, to give um, form to the work, to provide a kind of um, stepping stone into the work, but it's not straight translation. It's creative work, which is using translation as one of its techniques to provide materials. So let's look at the comparison of Bhattikavya 2.3 and Ojavanese Ramayana 2.5. This is a well-known image, but in the Old Javanese, only the first two lines of Bhatti are retained. But these figures developed around what Malinata describes as two instances of embrace, or shlesha, that speak of the jealousy of the banks whose land lotuses are increased in whiteness from the desire to emulate the water lotuses. The old Javanese re uh, parallel retains the first embrace, but in C and D shifts to a naturalistic description with Utpreksha-like qualities. The pugnacious pike who disturbs the reflections of the trees in the water is said to ma'idi, or medi, tease the trees reflected in the water. So I've used, um, I've used boldface type for medi to indicate something which to me is symptomatic of Utpreksha. The forest groves were charming, as if they intentionally bent over to look at their mirrored images and gazed intently at their reflections that stood out clearly in the river. So far, Bhatti. But a pugnacious pike was in a teasing mood and darted quickly to and fro throwing the clear reflections into dark and a confused mass. I've heard this sung in Old Javanese um, in this Mabasan section. That's where I got the idea of a teasing mood. I take I'm, a little bit of a free translation. Maybe just means to tease. But the pike, the way the Balinese translator said that the pike was in a teasing mood. So I mean, it's just a little bit of freedom in translation, the kind of freedom that I often t take too often. Uh, the second <laughs> example. Bhattikavya 2.2 compared to Old Javanese Ramayana 2.4. Um, the red lotus in Bhattikavya, the red lotuses displayed an extra extraordinary flame-like beauty. Their petals were a tremble with the lapping waves, with their crowds of bees they shone, their light like fire from a smoking lamp. Uh, that's fa Fallon. The Old Javanese, Utpalatang Kmuda Kapwa Mukar Parabang Riak riak nikang talaga ye ka dumeh ya chala byakta in katon kadi dila ning apui ya mola kumbang pramanta igruhurnya akan kukusnya so again i've un i've underlined what seemed to me to be the jotaka for the similes and i've used bold face for what 
seem to be the more direct um, associations of rupaka. The lotuses had opened widely, all of them blossoming, all of them red. When the ripples of the lake set them in motion, they looked just like the moving flame of a fire, while the bees moving restlessly above them were like the smoke of the fire. And here's, well, I have a bit of an, of an obsession. I want to find definite proof of a commentary. I did that for the Raghuvamsha, and I never really found definite proof, but some very uh, interesting possibilities. When we look at the commentary of Jaya Mangalo on this verse, we see that he refers to the similarity, Tuya Twat, of the moving lotuses and flames. Malinata, writing several hundred years later, explains that these similarities mean that the verse should be understood as a case of Upama. And it raises the question in my mind. Are they working with a handbook? And if they're working with a handbook, are they working with a handbook with a commentary? I think that if they're working with a handbook at all, they must be working with a handbook and a commentary. At that stage, in the, pre in the transmission of, of information and knowledge from India, there is strong evidence for a technique of translation, of commentary, translation as commentary. In other words, in the didactic tradition of old Javanese, you have what looks like an, an Indian commentary, but the commentary section is in Old Javanese. In other words, you have the shloka, and then you have an expansion on the shloka, you have a commentary on the shloka in Old Javanese. To me, this technique was developed as a part of the pedagogy of the Buddhist institutions of Sumatra. It migrated to Java and became a part of the, the pedagogy of the Javanese world, in both Buddhist and Hindu organizations. Um, and in this period to produce the old Javanese Ramayana, there's clearly something like a rivalry between the Buddhist institutions and the Hindu institutions, rivalry for patronage. But both of them seem to do, have done pretty well. The Shailendras created Borobudur, a massive monument, and less than 100 years later, the Sanjayas produced Prambanan, but the Sanjayas also apparently <coughs> funded the the completion of Borobudur. So there was nothing like uh, antagonism between the two different schools. And my assumption is that they shared uh, techniques, which under, I think there's no doubt about it. We have works like the Sanghyang Kamahayanakan, which is a uh, old Jav uh, Sanskrit shlokas, w identifiable with an old Javanese commentary, Buddhist. Then we have the Rahaspati Tatwa, does the same thing, but it draws on information from the Shaiva Agama, and from the Pashupata, from um, all manner, well, basically from the Shaiva Agama. And they share the same technique. It's a translational technique which is based on the Indian commentary. Um, in a paper that I wrote for a book that Ronit has co-edited, I said there's two things, two kinds of translation are going on in ancient Java. One is the kind of translation that takes the form of an Indian commentary. And then you always see the Indian footprint. You always have the shloka. Now, that became the way of the, the operational mode for the Parva literature. That's the operational mode of Parva. You take a, 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 you take a pratika, maybe it's a shloka, maybe it's a word, and then you have a, a section of narrative that jumps off from that pratika. That also was applied in the 14th century uh, work Tantri Kamandaka, which is probably the, the first attempt to write a real prose work in Old Javanese, and they do the same thing. It seems like they can't imagine prose without a pratika approach, without a shloka pra, pra, pratika ex, exposition. Uh, but that's the opposite of what goes on in Kakawin. In Kakawin, you have to suppress the, the footprint the footprint can be there, but it mustn't be visible. In other words, because the, this is the way I look at it anyway, the, the old Javanese poets want to produce a language and a literature of their own. That literature reflects the Indian models, but it should never be subservient to them. It should bring them, it should bring those models into the Javanese context. And that's why it's so hard to find the footprint sometimes, because of that tendency to not make it obvious what the footprint is. Or maybe that's arguable. Maybe you'll argue with me on that. 
Do I have much time? Uh -huh. <laughs> so sorry. There's just too much to say about the old Javanese Ramayana is a huge and very fascinating work. Okay, very quickly. Next Artam Alankara block is in OJR 71033, an extended lover's lament, only some of which is, comes from Bhati Kavya. Let's look just at the old Javanese. Ah, the breeze that softly blows from north to south, its fragrance pleasing, carrying along the scent of Kadamba blossoms. Even sages living in the forest, even a sage living in the forest who has conquered his senses, clearly will feel suffer, will suffer longing and heartache because of it. Um, I won't bother with example four because the, the, the most important, 717, I'll have to skip to, but what I'll do now is jump up to page five, the template applied in Art um, Lankara block in OJR 17, 105.110. Um, I've given you the English except for two, just the English except for two of the passages, um, and those are 107 and 108. And here in the Ashoka Grove, it is truly attractive and beautiful, and it is thick with fragrant flowers that fall without seizing. Ah, how could it make one separated from a lover happy when she is there? Even a silent monk would yearn if he came here. I should read 106 first, I'm sorry. Likewise, the coolness of the moon's beams is great, but I feel that they are hot and have become a fire that burns high. The full moon is constantly uncovered by cloud and always shining, shining brightly. Ah, how could it be pleased that one separated from a lover is constantly pained? Um, quickly going on, page six. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Go back again for a second. Where am I? Ah. Um, I think I didn't give you something I wanted to give you. <laughs> Okay, well, to cut to the chase, number eight, if there is a smoking gun, Apanuti and the Kavya Darsha and the OJR. As Bhatti's example of Ap as Fallon notes, Bhatti's example of Apanuti is problematical in that there is no element of comparison, only de denial. With that in mind, we might ask what the likely source for the three cases of uh, Apanuti presented in OJR 17, 106, 107, and 8. What is the source? If we turn without further ado to Dundon's examples of Apanuti and his discussion of KD 302-306, the resemblance is immediate and striking. From Yigal's translation, sandalwood paste, moonbeams, the mild perfume breeze from the south, they are all fire. As far as I am concerned, they are cool only for everyone else. I don't think I've really um, given you enough to, to show what I'm feeling here, but what, I'm, what I feel is that there is no other possible source for this fascination with, the, with Apanuti. The kinds of Apanuti that you find in Bhatti just don't cut it compared to these Apanuti, and these Apanuti go, are so reminiscent of, of, of Kavya Darsha, of Dandan. And there are many other things. There's the fact that Tulia and Upama show up early in the tradition, there are more trivial examples, like the fact that um, Pratiloma Yamaka shows up in 1365, just out of the blue. There are no other Yamakas. That's another dis thing that, that's another point that needs a huge discussion. Why does Yamaka disappear? Yamaka disappears after the OJR. Anuprasa stays there, very, very much so, all throughout the tradition. And the Javanese have a tradition called Purwakanti. Um, Purvakanti is anusara, uh, Anuprasa in the Javanese tradition, but Yamaka goes away as if they had heard something, as if Abhinava Gupta or as if Ananda Vardhana had reached them somehow, and they, don't, they no longer favor Yamaka. It's almost as if they've abandoned it on purpose. So my, I feel now, having done, gone through this in my head and done these things, I will try to write a de uh, more reasonable article which really shows more of what I was going through when I was reading this. The implications are enormous. If we read the old Javanese Ramayana from the point of view of a, of a group or a pedagogy or some kind of institution where students are learning to write poetry, and the old Javanese Ramayana gets better as it goes along. The, the similes and metaphors in the second verse are, are made better in the seventh, and then in the seventeenth, even better. 
It seems to me a learning exercise, and this is, and also I go against the grain here. I do not think that the old Java, Javanese Ramayana was produced by a single author, and I don't even know if it was, I think it may have even pr been produced over a series of generations, because there are two distinct breaks. At, at Canto 16, they abandon Bhatti. And then again in 24, uh, Canto 24, verse 92, there's something that Zudmuller himself said. There's a change of voice here. After that, there's these mad dundakas that Ronit and Pete Becker brilliantly translated, and Pete called them the rap music of Java. You know, and they're a completely different voice. So I look at this as an enormous experiment in how to produce ca a cacaoan. And it's an experiment that's been going, going on in a school somewhere, in some kind of school of poetics. So I'll be brave and say that's my position and see what you think and attack me so we can find out more. Thank you very much, Tom. Questions, David? <coughs> Um, so first I, I want to say that there's um, an indisputable conclusion that has arisen from these two papers today, which is that the next time we convene this group, it really should be in Bali. And, um, it could be arranged. Yeah, okay. We'll think along those lines and work towards that. And I also uh, just want to say that uh, I agree entirely with what Yigal said, that from both of these very beautiful presentations, you can see how the Javanese, Balinese um, uh, world is a particularly critical example for, our, um, for the kind of project that we're involved in here. It offers us a distinctive perspective on the entire problem. So there are different ways of talking about that. Um, you gave us an indigenous uh, image, which I think we might want to do something with. That's your quotation from the old Javanese Ramayana 2.5, this beautiful image of the mirror, which is, after all, you know, central to the whole way we have of talking about, uh, about the Kavya Dausha. So here are the forest groves. They're charming. That's another important thing, the charmingness. But it's as if they were intentionally bent over to look at their mirrored images, and they're gazing intently, the intently also matters, at their reflections. And then, though, a pugnacious pike was in a teasing mood and darted quickly to and fro, throwing the clear reflec the refle reflections into a dark and confused mess. Here's a fantastic paradigm for the entire project that we've been engaged <laughs> in all week. <laughs> you know, so I want to just say something about that project. I mean, you know, uh, just a thought. Um, there is, I mean, Java is particularly helpful here because it shows that as we move from uh, India to some other place, um, so, on the one hand, there's a great uh, temptation, um, like most temptations not to be resisted, to look for discrete elements that we can find, let us say, in the Kavya Dausha, and then we can also find them, as you have found, in some other exotic uh, form of this kind of, uh, you know, poetic project. So, as I say, it's a kind of temptation because of course, we're always happy if we can find some specific, discrete element that has been translated, to use the term that you're using, whatever we want to mean by that. Okay, that's, that's always helpful, and because that also allows us to begin to formulate empirically or inductively uh, principles of selection, including, um, I mean, if we say selection, that means there are going to be things that didn't um, cross this barrier, and those silences will be interesting. Uh, you know, so that's one way one way of thinking about it. But I think the deeper project um, it has to do not with the transfer of particular content so much, interesting as that may be, but with the assimilation of a kind of mode of analysis, which has been driving really so much of what we've done all week. So there are things we can say about that mode and. You know, I mean, for example, you might say, uh, this, this, this um, you know, speaks to the question of what it is in the Kavya Darsha that is so um, compelling, you might say. Here is a mode which has certain definitive features. It tends to be future-oriented. It tends to be recursive in ways that we can understand. It, um, 
it has a whole set of features which tend towards the proliferation in a kind of involuted manner. This is a mode of analysis or a mode of thinking which um, I think is far more powerful as a package, a cultural package, than any of the discrete contents that we're talking about. So he, you see it very beautifully in the Indonesian case, you know, because those features of the sort of underlying driving model, one might say, the kind of mental world that Dundin has somehow articulated, those features do translate. Also, perhaps, I don't know, but it looks to me like they may well have translated into Kukai's Chinese-Japanese version. And, and this offers us, I think, a way of beginning to kind of define the questions of um, difference and transmission and so on. Do you want to respond? Well, I'm learning from this group of an, a new way of reading. So this is a, uh, I mean, I forgot to mention how grateful I am to be among you because I'm learning a new way of reading and I'm stopped looking for the smoking gun. But for me, it's very important to have, for my ideas about the social context, but in which the old Javanese language was being created along with the Kakawin. So the reason I'm looking for the handbooks and the reason I'm looking for the textual evidence is because I feel that we need to have an understanding of the social context. And the social context has to have been, to me, one of study and learning and using the materials that were coming in in a creative new way. And uh, Dunn is so attractive here because of his modularity, because of his open-endedness. And they're certainly open-ended. They're constantly improving upon themselves. The Uprekshas that we looked at. Panulo, in the course of his life, developed the same basic group preksha three different times. Was it three or four times? They're constantly innovating, and that somehow seems symptomatic, more, much more of Dundon than anybody <coughs> else I can think of, that, that open-endedness open in creativity. I hope that's sort of an answer. <laughs> yes. Um, I, uh, I, uh, I have a... Sorry, uh, may I? I have a, uh, a, a comment which... Uh, has to, to do with reading practices and exactly, I think, the kind of thing we're talking about. I was absolutely, I mean, I was struck by, by what you were saying about the, the method, I mean, the, the, this way to talk about translation as a, as a stepstone uh, for crea creativity. And uh, these combine with the, the, the absence of an explicit Shastric tradition. Because uh, we are not necessarily looking for those things uh, within the South Asian context, but it is all over the place. Uh, the, 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 the work that I'm finishing now on uh, Bengali translations of Persian and Awadi text into, in, uh, into Bengali in Arakan using, uh, if not exactly, and, and that's what's interesting, because in the Bengali case, Bengali poets were not Alankarikas. They, there is no trace that they were really they had any expertise in the specific field of Alankaras. What was driving them, and we we're going back, it's Sangita. Yeah. It's oh. Sangita, and if they have yeah. a, a, a domain of Shastric reference, it is Sangita, and <coughs> then after, of course, performance inside. And in Alaul's case, what you were saying is exactly that. I mean, mm. <laughs> if I may advertise a bit for whatever <laughs> will come out in the, g in the coming months, um, I have an analysis of translation techniques, and what I put forward is that in his translations, we see a progression from literal translation, from a closed translation, to a progressive departure within a narrative section. And you can see that he, he uses po the, his models exactly the way that you've been describing it. It's a stepstone, it ignites, it uh, kindles the inspiration, and then he, he continues. And so it's, I mean, and that's one thing. And the second thing, I also argue for his acquaintance with commentarial traditions. And that's also part of, uh, of, uh, of the process of unpacking meaning in a creative way. It is informed by this uh, Shastri. So it's, again, in a, in a South Asian country, all the things that you say are absolutely uh, relevant and extremely important, I think, if we want to have more nuanced ways to talk about translation. And I was, of course, thinking about Devin and uh, David's work on, uh, on those questions. I'm sorry. No, it's so fine. If you <laughs> well, uh, somehow on the way to this handout, I erased one of the important examples, which is the comparison of 710 
with um, 17107, I think it is. It's the same, it's pretty much the same apanuti, but it's been elaborated greatly in the, in the later version with much more anuprasa. So th within the tradition, there's this constant development that's going on. Um, <coughs> and it is, it's, it's, the, the, the translation part is the, is the sort of stepping stone. And it leads to further creativity. Among the alankaras that you have mentioned, there is one sandeha, yeah. uh, doubt. Yeah. And uh, I have a sandeha. Mm, is uh, Tom's music greater or <laughs> his presentation <laughs> of this? <laughs> I don't think I'm a good presenter, but thank you. <laughs> Well, um, in another article I wrote, I, I, used, I used one of Professor Nagaraj, Raghurao's um, points of assistance back in 2003 and four. He identified an aprastuti prashamsa in one of the later Kakawins. And I haven't even looked at the later Kakawins, but and now that I have this feeling that we can use the Alankara Shastra of the Kavya Darsha as a model, as a... We don't necessarily say that everyone's studying it all along, but it, what I feel is that there in the old Javanese Ramayana continuously be, be developed. And <coughs> it, it appears to me that they get always more sophisticated. You have to wonder, are they s continuing to get input from something in India? Or it, but it's partly, obviously, that they're working within their own tradition. I mean, they had, it was, it, this was not a, to be an Mpu, to be a writer, a composer of Kakawin meant you were very close to the political center. You were the head of an, you might be the head of a religious institution. Impu is a title given to blacksmiths who deal with something very magical, and poets, and, and heads of religious institutions. And Panulu, when he was a young man, when he wrote the Hari Vangsha, he says, I presented my, my Kakawin to Jayabaya, my king, whose pen name is, what is it? Um, Lunglangu Inglangu. The, the, the he who sprouts sprouts of beauty. And he said, and my king was furious and berated me for being a bad poet. And I was so ashamed I didn't go out in public for weeks. But I'm still going to read this to you. He says, read it to you. I'm still going to present this Kakawin to you. Then later in his life, he does the Gatot Kacha Asraya, which is a masterpiece beyond compare. I mean, within the tradition, it's one of the great masterpieces. And so there's this constant urge to become greater. And they were, they could be very severely reprimanded at court if they did not produce the highest quality. Uh, thank you, that was so interesting. And um, I wanted to actually ask you to talk a little bit more about Anuprasa. Um, and, you know, to me, that's a profoundly Dravidian phenomena, right? It's <sighs> Uh, present in all of the Dravidian languages, and um, you know, so I'm I'm wondering if it's possible that this kind of transmission, this package, is, you know, Kavya Darsha and something from the south, and you know, just to also go back to to Helen's presentation, you know, the presence of the nine rasas is something that happens very early in the Kaviraja Margam, which you know we date to like 840 or 850, and all nine are there as well, and I sort of wonder if that might not be one of the most common uh, changes that happens in the sort of vernacular transmission of the Kavya Darsha. So I just, but it, the no, Anuprasa no. question, please, I'd love to hear more. Well, the Southern connection is clear. Agastya is the great patron saint of Javanese Shaivaism. I mean, Agastya is one of the, you have in the, sh in the Shaiva pa pantheon of Chandi Pramanan, you have Shiva in the east, north you have Durga, West, you have Ganesha, and south, you have Agastya, and, Gane and Kumbhaja, whatever. That's one sign. Um, the other one is, I was working on the Kakawan Gatot Kacha Asraya, and I saw a word that ended in Apu. Oh, this is Tamil. And I found out it was an aquatic plant that floats on the surface of waves, and it's part of the image in this poem. So that's a clear foot, southern footprint. And then, in the 1300s, the court in, in the Desha Warnana, the court poet is, is called the Pandya. 
It's called the Pandya. So the southern footprint is all over the place, and it would stand to reason. Now, the translation problem is, is immense, because uh, Austronesian and Dravidian languages would be very hard to master both. I tried once and couldn't. I mean, I took Tamil and couldn't. I can't do both in one lifetime. And I, I think the, um, tra but you know, bi what's the bilingual situation? Who are the bilinguals and who, and, but some of them are coming from South India, clearly. Were they using, were they, because possibly Malay or Javanese was easier, uh, more approachable for a southerner and they could learn it and communicate at the court and, and have a presence like that. Um, but the southern footprint is very clear. And if, uh, if Anupras is, a, as I, I suppose it is in Tamil, I mean, he, he, it's and very highly, but it's developed in the old Javanese Ramayana, which is not necessarily from that period when the southern influence was strongest, but it's a good idea to look for that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in Kannada and Telugu. I mean, it's, it's very distinctively Dravidian in my mind, so that's interesting. Good to hear. Thank you. Did I? Bottom of page four. No, I don't think not. I'll, I'll post it. I'll post it. I'm waiting for the, the opposition. Well, here it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there. I want to separate kind of two arguments. One I found completely convincing and actually revolutionary in a way. Um, is that the insight in the process of creating a poetic language, making Javanese into a poetic language, the poets had to make certain changes and enhance the language in such a way to be able to translate and be receptive to these figures. And some of, I mean, the kind of, you know, everyone has similes, right? Everyone in the world. <coughs> but um, an example that you went over very quickly about Utpreksha and the use of maha, is um, it, it kind of condenses into a single word our various blackboards of discussion uh, the other night, and and I th I think that that's very important that that there's a kind of this shows the the process of liter literarization in action, and it's uh, very interesting. With Dundon, I mean, I I want to say that I'm just not convinced at all that uh, Dundon is here in any capacity and I want to, well the specific reason for that is Apahnuti, I mean Apahnuti is a, it's, a, it's an alankara, right? And the idea that pleasing things, beautiful things can be hurtful to people who are separated is not Apahnuti. Mm. So there's um, and that when you said something very telling, which is that there's no other source besides oh, Bhatti and, um, and Dundon for mm -hmm. these kinds of ideas, and that raised all sorts of questions like, well, actually there, are, there must be tons of other sources, and what are they, and what, are th what is the curriculum to continue with your pedagogical educational um, <coughs> emphasis here? I mean, what is, what is actually on the curriculum? Are they are they reading things like Kalidasa or the Mahakavyas? And I mean, it's I think you can speak to that. Um, but um, no, I I guess the the basic form of the question is 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 it possible to imagine a world in which you have this very Dundon esque type of poetics, which is modular, which is very flexible, which uses uh, kind of figures in these very kind of self-referential ways that has no historical connection to Dundon whatsoever. Hmm. Um, I, I sh are you? Yeah, no, no. Um, I actually didn't mean to quite say that. I meant that the Apanuti of Bhatti is not the one that's in the old, but I need to go back to Apanuti if I've misunderstood it. Um, I hope we'll do that. Uh, from for the, the ones that I've, in my studies, I think I've shown the Buddha Charita, at least verses, um, cantos five to eight of the Raghu Vamsa, which became the Sumanasa Antaka. 
There are evidences of Raghuvamsha 9. Um, in the Samara Dahana, there's a clear reference to the Kumara Sambhava. We're not sure if that's a particularity of the composer or part of the traditional pedagogy. But at least we have Buddha Charita and parts of the Raghuvamsha, if not the whole thing. And we have the Bhatti Kavya. Um, and I guess what I'm more of a, maybe I should just say it intuitively, it seems to me Dundon has an obsession with images around painful things, you know, beautiful things becoming painful, and also images of the love god shooting his arrows, and they're all over the old Javanese Ramayana. And there's, has anyone ever heard this image of the bloodshot eyes of the lovelorn man or woman are bloodshot because the heart has been stabbed with the dagger of, of the love god? Or is that exclusively old Javanese? But that's kind of, there's this obsession with, with the love god and his arrows. This all sounds very Dundonesque to me, but it's intuitive. It's not, I, can, I have to go back and try to make, trace the footsteps and see if there's really much, you know, if something can be gleaned from those comparisons. So I will work on it. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, you gave us a long list of uh, particles for comparison, or words expressing comparison. And I understand that you compiled that list. Uh, but when you did that, uh, you, you did the same thing as uh, the person who composed the Uvama Vial section of the Tolkapiam. He gives a list of 36 words for comparison. And then, uh, since uh, <coughs> the theory in the Uvama Vial is that comparison can be based on four things uh, <coughs> Vinay, Payan, May, and Uru, then he gives four separate lists the particles which can be used for comparison based on Vinay, another list of particles which can be used for comparison on Payan. So Vinay is action, Payan is utility, and uh, <coughs> May is body, and uh, Uru is color. So for e each of those categories, we have a list of particles. So he was somehow thinking like you when he was trying to describe how comparisons are made. Yeah. yeah interesting. It actually sounds like the author of the Evil Magia was reading Dundon, but that's another story. Um, I have a, uh, th th when uh, you were in Andrew's question and your response, uh, there was a kind of a complex thing that started, train of thought that started developing in my head. Let me try to put it together. I'm gonna, so it's going to be, it's a historical point and then a formal point and then a bigger conceptual point. I'll try to stick to all three of those and try to be brief because I was running out of time. Um, both here and in, and in some of the things you've done in the, the Kavya book, I mean, what I think is really just a remarkable you know, contribution, and I'm certain you're absolutely right about this, is this idea of collective kind of social authorship of this major literary monument. And this is again, going back to what David said, I think this is another thing that we can maybe think, think back onto Indic materials or materials all over, indeed all over Asia, about this idea of decentering this idea of a single author and looking at something as a kind of product of, yeah, of a, of a social interaction and as, as you say, a pedagogy. Um, like I said, I think that's completely convincing um, and really, yeah, really significant. And that's going to be the through line that I want to talk about here. So the first thing, the thing that's going to end in an actual question has to do with, um, on page two, letter C, the, th the list that Jean-Luc was just referring to. Um, the thing that really jumps out to me is the thing second from the bottom, where we have Ucken. 80% of the occurrences in the entire corpus are here in this sense. Um, that's a, I mean, this is the same Akin that gives you the causative morpheme, you think, no, or is it, it a separate? No, it's not actually. Okay. It's, it's an interesting, um, not quite sure why that is, but it's not the same. Okay. It's actually, this Akin occurs in, in Malay also, no. which is Akan Akan, as if, so it's a different Akin. Okay. It's not, a morph, it's not the morpheme Akin that's used for the causative. Okay. It's a different I, Between this and also the earlier work that you referred to here about Yamaka, I guess the, so the, the sort of practical question I want to ask you about <coughs> is about things being selected out. Um, and if we have, again, this dynamic social composition where, I mean, where, where maybe that Darwinian metaphor isn't entirely out of place here. That things, are, things are used and then get filtered out in the process of the composition and the reading and the ultimate reception of the, the OJR. And the, the Arya meter might be another example, too. It's just too weird. To, you can't really, or, or, or it was just this one virtuoso thing that no one ever tried to outdo again. Yeah. But the bigger and more conceptual question, speaking about the lack of the smoking gun, 
is about, um, and, and connecting this up with this idea of social authorship, is uh, Samahara. What, one of the things that actually Dundon says he's doing, right? This came up, I think Dragomir mentioned this yesterday. Purva Shastrani Samahritya, having brought together other pre prior texts. Um, and I wonder if, from this perspective that you're giving us here, that Dundon becomes, for all of his genius, that I'm still happy to, I'm still happy to put myself on the line saying he's a genius, he's a node, though. Mm. And it's more important, maybe, maybe what we all, I mean, if I can speak for everyone for a second, maybe the thing we learn from all of this is the nodal quality rather than the direct arrow <coughs> of influence quality is maybe the thing that actually is what so is signally important about the Kavya Darsha and about this phenomenon. Um, so I'll just leave it at that because I've talked about it. But about this, I wanted to hear, I'd like to hear what you think about the, the, the this <coughs> so selection process. Yeah, it's quite complicated. Need more work. But what I think about the selection process. Yeah, well, partly uh, this, 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 this set of, this core set that I've identified. And I, I don't think I cl really made that clear. What I'm trying to say is that it seems as if they have a core set, and that's the ones they use. And the, the ones that they don't use are ones that don't work. Deepika doesn't work in, in Old Javanese. I mean, I can't think of how you would do a Deepika. But yamaka works perfectly well, and kanchi yamaka or chakra va, va works beautifully, and, but it's abandoned. So there are different kinds of, of um, pressures on the system. The pressure that makes yamaka disappear and makes arya disappear is a different pressure from, from some of the others which are about the selectivity. Uh, Old Javanese has a, a, powerful a powerful set of referential tools. It, you know, Indian language, uh, Sanskrit is based on what? inflectional endings. None of that is there in Austronesian, but there's a very powerful set of referential, referential methods. And those are the ones, they seem to be developing those in the service of poetry. And when they can't make that work, when they have a figure that comes in, it's in Bhattikabhya, so they know about it, but it doesn't work in their language, they just don't use it. So there is selectivity going on. And this set that I've identified seems to me be, to be the set they more or less settle on. Oh, these are the ones, and look, I mean, the preksha is all over the place in Old Javanese. It seems as if there's certain figures that, were, that fit with the, with the indigenous Austronesian um, structure of language and thought, and those are the ones that were selected. Um, of course, simile is practically universal, so that would stand to reason. And then the development of a, but the development of an apparatus for simile, that sounds like it has some influence from art, from the Shastras, from the Shastra tradition. Um, so yes, yeah, selectivity is there, and then I think there are various kinds of pressures on the selectivity. One is the differences of, between Indo-European inflectional languages and Austronesian languages. Another one, though, is, seems to have to do with styles in poetry. And I still wonder, is it possible that, they are, that they're <coughs> that there's some kind of um, long distance effect from, Abina, uh, from Ananda Vardhana, from the school of Dwani, because they seem to develop their own internal <coughs> ideas about suggestion, although there's no clear, I, I tried very hard to find some kind of evidence for Dwani in, in, ter in terms of the, the terminal terminology of Dwani. It's not there as far as I can see, but they have very, very powerfully developed suggestions the techniques of suggestion. It makes you wonder. And of course, all of the, all the while this is going on, the Shaiva Agama is continuing to come in. I mean, Andrea Akri's work on the Shaiva Agama text of the Balinese Tutor tradition, this is going on all the way up to the sixth.
okay, on this happy note, um, thank